I've never gone through anything like that, so I can't sit here and say, I, you know, I can imagine how it is, because... It's sad that it happened, you know, and it's sad that you have to live with it. Yeah. And it's even worse that there's people out here like them defense investigators. It's just, and it, my son told me yesterday, he said he had talked to... You have your micro cassette? Huh? Micro cassette. Don't have one, get one. Yeah, if you, if you get, get one, we'll, we'll just set it in here too, so that way that'll be easier for him. I was actually, I've been here since uh, 91, okay. 1991. Um, I wasn't uh, wasn't working in the criminal investigation division in, in, in 90, uh, 93, 94. I, I didn't come until uh, 96. Okay. Upstairs here. I've been here ever since. Today's date is Thursday, June 21st, 2007. Time now is 9.32 a.m. I'm Detective Lieutenant Ken Mitchell, presently along with Detective Chuck Knowles. Uh, we're presently in the CID office of the West Memphis Police Department conducting an interview with Mr. Terry Wayne Hobbs, H-O-B-B-S, um, in reference to uh, the uh, triple homicide involving three uh, little boys from 1993. Uh, <coughs> The case number is 9305-0666 is the case number. And uh, I'd like to go back over a couple of things with you, if, if I could, to start off with. Uh, the first one is a Rule 2.3 rights form um, that Detective Knowles went over with you just a few minutes ago. Um, do you understand the 2.3, and are you here voluntarily today, Terry? I understood the rule, and I am here voluntarily. Okay. The first signature below that, is that yours? Yes, sir. And below your signature is that Detective Knowles yes, as a witness? Okay. Now I was not present for when you went over this with Correct. Okay. What's your, uh, if you would state your full name and your date of birth. Terry Wayne Hobbs, 521-1958. And you're currently how old right now? 49. Okay. Terry, um, what we'd like to do, and what I was telling you just a few minutes ago, um, is uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney, Mr. Davis, has asked us to uh, interview a couple of people uh, with the, in light of some um, possible new evidence that, that may have come up and just to uh, fill in some blanks, I guess, uh, as far as this case goes, um, that, that might be helpful. Um, and that's, that's what we've been asked to do. That's why we, we called and asked you, uh, went to take a notes, called you yesterday and asked if you could come in. And I, com uh, I appreciate greatly uh, your availability to us. I mean, that you just came in and can do this. What we'd like to do with you to start out with, if you would, if you would take us back to May the 5th, 1993, okay? And I'm going to start out by just asking a few questions and I'm going to let you just kind of care, walk us through the day in your, in your mind, what you can remember. If you're not sure of something, you know, just tell us you're not sure. Or you don't know, you don't know. Um, I'm going to move this a little closer to you and make it, make, make it a little clearer when you're speaking to us. Uh, do you, uh, where were you living? You remember where you were living at, at, on May the 5th, 1993? May the 5th, we were living on the College Street in West Memphis. You remember the address? 1601. Okay, and who, okay, who all lived in that house? Amanda, Terry, Pam, Stevie, and Amanda. Okay, uh, and I hadn't said one, for purposes of this interview, uh, when you say, Pam, who are you talking about? Pam Hobbs, my okay. wife. Okay. At the time. Um, you said Stevie. Pam, or my stepson, Pam's son. Uh, what's what's his, what's his last name? Steve Edward Branch. Okay. And, a cool man. and how old was Stevie at the time? At the time, eight years old. Okay. And you said Amanda. Amanda Hobbs, my daughter. She was four at the time. 
Okay. Um, was uh, she your daughter with Pam? Correct. Okay. All right. She was. You said she was four. Correct. Okay. Born here in West Memphis. Okay. And and on May the fifth of that year, um, it was Pam working anywhere? Uh, Catfish Island in West Memphis. I'm not sure of the street, but it's over by that Union 76 truck stop. Okay, and on at that particular time also, were you working? I was working at Memphis Ice Cream Company in Memphis, Tennessee. Where is where is Memphis? 914 James Street. James, is it still? It's still there. Still there? Mm -hmm. What was your What was your job title and, and job description for I was a merchandiser. I sold ice cream. Do you have a do you do that over the phone or do you have a route or no, I ran a route. You ran a route. What did your route consist of? Uh, going to mom and Paul storage, little corn groceries, and filling up freezers and selling ice cream. Was that uh, was your route in strictly in Tennessee or No, I come to West Memphis. Marion. Uh Four City, up that way, Mariana. Do you do you so do you have a route in, in Tennessee and in Arkansas? And Mississippi. And Mississippi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, do you remember working the, on May the fifth, nineteen ninety three? I do. What was your? Do you remember your schedule that day? What time you you got up, went in? What time you got home? Excuse me. I usually every day went in about five thirty a.m. and I'd get off around two two thirty three o'clock p.m. Uh, about every day. <coughs> now this this particular day, May the fifth. Do you remember about what time you got home? Roughly guessing around three, three thirty, something like that. And was anybody home when you got there? Pam and Amanda was home. Okay. Um, did uh, Did you see Stevie anywhere? I did not. He wasn't there. Do you know where he was at? When I walked in, I always checked on the kids, and I didn't see Stevie, so I asked Pam, uh, "Where's Stevie?" And she said he went off to ride his bicycle with Michael Moore, his bicycle, which his grandparents had just bought him prior to that day. Uh, <clears throat> what, uh, if you can remember, what kind of day it had that day been for you? I mean, was it a, anything about the day that stood out up to that point? No, just another working day, getting home from work. And Pam was cooking supper. Uh, Anything unusual when you got home at all? Nothing other than uh, Stevie wasn't home. And I always wanted to know where the kids were at. That's why I asked her. You know what, you remember what Amanda was doing during that time? Or Seemed like she was in uh, Stevie's bedroom watching TV. No, but just nobody else in the house other than you and, and Pam and Amanda? Right. Okay. Did anybody come over while you were home after you got, after you got in? No. No? Um, do you, did, did Pam work that particular day? She did. Do you know what her hours were? I think from 5 till 9 or closing, whatever time they closed. It might have been 10, but it seemed like it was 9. How many, uh, how many different vehicles did y'all own at that time? I know of two, but it could have been three because I like to work on old trucks and I had, I believe I had one at that time. I like to restore trucks and sell them. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think I had one. I know we had two vehicles. Hey, uh, were the other two ones that you drove? Correct. And we remember what they were? Not really. No, not really. Did both you and Pam drive daily? Yeah. I drove one to work. I'm trying to think of why I drove to work. It's a long time ago. Sure. We had a LeBaron, no price for LeBaron. Uh, we bought from City Motors here in West Memphis. That might have been one I was trying to make me blue. Okay. I'm just guessing. Now, um, this particular day, the 5th, uh, do you remember what time Pam left for work? When we came, when I got home and seen Stevie wasn't there, she told me he had to, he was supposed to be home at 4.30. So 
So from the time I got home, she was cooking supper, and I would walk out to the driveway and to see if I could see him coming down the road on his bicycle because he's proud of his new bike. And I didn't see him. So from we waited around, and she had to be at work by five. And you know, I would go in and out of the house to see if I could see him coming because I had to take her to work. And you know, you just don't want to leave the kids at home by themselves. No, we didn't. And he wouldn't. He didn't show up. Is there any particular reason you had to take Pam to work? I don't know if there's a particular reason. I just did it. It's just the way we did things. Okay. And I take her to work and I pick her up from work. Okay. Okay. Um, so who all went when you took Pam to work? Who all went? I drove. Pam went with me and Amanda. Okay. Um, let me back up just a second. During this time period, 1993 up to, say, from the beginning of, of 93 up to the, the 5th of May. Um, describe your marriage with Pam. How, what, how was your marriage? How would you describe it? Could have been better. We'd had some... Pam had a problem of staying faithful. She really did. And that got me, but she had a something. She was working at Poncho's one time down here and we had pool parties every once in a while and some of the people from Poncho's would come over and one night I'd come in there after one of our pool parties. We didn't want the drunk people to drive so we just let them you know, fall out and wherever you laid is where you woke up at. Well one night I would get up going through the house looking at people making sure everybody's okay and Pam and is standing there wrapped up in the arms of a Mexican. His name is Jesse, and he worked at Poncho's with Pam. Well, I whooped the dog in Jesse. It probably wasn't right, but I did. And, but, you know, that, that happened. And it was so, I'm not gonna say we had the perfect marriage, but that did happen during before all that happened. But uh, just, we had a pretty good marriage, I thought. But you know, Pam just did some things you shouldn't. What you remember what room they were in when you said the kitchen? In the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Now, um, any other problems that that? come to mind as far as your marriage at all during that time prior to prior to the 5th of May obviously not really other than her family you know when I met Pam in that restaurant uh, then she asked me to marry her uh, her dad let me know right off the bat you ain't gotta make her happy you gotta make me happy and I kind of thought well that's kind of odd you know, I'm not marrying you, I'm marrying a girl. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, that statement was made, and, and I don't know, nothing bad that I could think of had happened. You know, other than I'd seen the son-in-laws beat up from the dad and the brother when the girls would call home crying to dad or mom, but my husband did this, I'd seen the brother and dad go up and beat them up. And I just thought, well, I don't want that to happen to me. So I tried to stay away from them. Do you and Pam ever have any kind of physical confrontations at all during that part of your marriage? No. Okay. Not that I can think of. Um, yeah, as, far as, the, as far as the children, um, as far as Stevie and Amanda, uh, discipline. Who did either or both of you discipline the kids when they did wrong? We would, sure. Both of you? Well, not to, not the double team. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we're both we're, did both of you. How how did you discipline your children? With a belt, okay. or make them stand in the corner, and or ground them, take some of what they like. The Stevie like Nintendo games, 
So we would borrow from the Nintendo or borrow from riding his bicycle. What about uh, Pam? Did, how did she discipline the kids? When she would yell at them, or not yell, not mean yell, but just being a mom that left it up to dad most of the time, but she would whoop them on you know, occasions. Um, so I guess from the two of you, who was the bigger disciplinarian? Dad. dad? <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, was there anything in particular uh, that you can remember that Stevie was you know, into? I understand it's an eight-year-old little boy, typical eight-year-old little boy. Is there any, any, anything he was really into at that time as far as some stuff he, something he really liked? And, well, he thought he liked watching Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. on TV, and he would get up there and think he was Bruce Lee, you know, doing his karate and backflips, and he liked to swim the pool. And we had the house, had a nice swimming pool in the backyard, and he, he enjoyed that. And he got into uh, the Boy Scouts. You know, he won that race that year with the little cars that they had to make. Oh, the soapbox derby? Yeah, he, he won that race that year. Did he really? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, Stevie's friends, did he have any any friends he was particularly close to or hung out with more? I would say a little boy named George. I don't know his last name. At the time it was George and Michael and Chris. Yeah. And then we had some friends lived a couple of streets over and we'd go over there, and of course they had uh, the girls a little bit older than Stevie was at the time, but he had a little crush on her, I think, or she might have had a crush on him. What do you know? Remember the name of those of those people? Yeah, David and Jabobby Kobe. David and Bobby Jacoby. Jacoby. Yeah. What street did they live on? From where we lived, you get on Macaulay, one or two streets over. I don't know the name of the street. But we go right now. I got David a job with me one time. He ran out of work, so they put him to work over work while I was working at the ice cream company to kind of help him out. And we played guitars together. And so, we, you know, Pam knew him from Global. That's how I met him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't really know him, but I met him through her. And when I got him the job where I worked at, they were kind of struggling. So I just trying to be nice and help out. Where are you originally from? Cave City, Arkansas. Cave City? Yeah. Not Cave City. Cave City. Um, what about Pam? Was she really from Blyville? From Blyville? In Steele, Missouri. I think in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did did Stevie ever have any, any friends come over and you know spend the night sleepovers or anything like that? He did. I'm just trying to think. Uh, Michael may have came. I'm not sure because it's been a while. Sure, certainly. Yeah. But uh, it seemed like there was some kids come over. I can't remember. George might have. This little boy named George. Do you ever remember uh, Stevie going to spend the night at anybody else's house? His grandparents a lot. Maybe his aunts and uncles on Pam's side of the family. Uh, I don't know about West Memphis, so I don't think so. It's possible, but I can't remember that one. You remember when y'all moved to West Memphis? 86 or 87, sometime in there, when the tornado had come through here. Mm -hmm. Did y'all move here before or after the tornado? After. Going back to May the 5th, you said before, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay, please, um, you said that you took Pam to work at Catfish Island. Okay, who went with you when you took her? Amanda. Okay. Um, and when you dropped Pam off at work, where did you and Amanda go from there? there? On our way to take Pam to work. Well, after I got home, if you remember, Pam told me that when I asked where Stevie was at, she said he was riding his bicycle with Michael Moore. So 
So on our way to take her to work, we went by the Moore's house to see if Stevie was there or Mike was there. Mm -hmm. Don was there. And uh, she told us that, you know, they're riding their bicycles. So, you know, me and Pam decided to take Pam to work and uh, I'd go back and I had Amanda with me. We'd go back and try to find them. And when we left Catfish Island, uh, we went back by the Moore's house and just started going street to street in the neighborhood to see if we could find them. And then you said you went back. Did you talk to Mr. and Mrs. Moore? No, I don't think Don or Dana was home at the time. Don was. And we did talk to her. You know, we other than asking her, Are Steve or Mike here? When we took Pam to work. Okay. And when I come back, you know, I didn't see any change. No bicycles in the front yard, so we just drove around street to street in the neighborhood and see if we could see them. You and Amanda. You and Amanda. Okay. Um, how long did you do that? Probably 30 minutes. And I went uh, maybe an hour. I don't know about the time exactly, but after we went back to see if we could find them in the neighborhood, me and Amanda, I took Amanda to when we both went home and I said, come on, we'll go walk around the neighborhood and see if we can hear them behind them fences in somebody's yard because I didn't know where George lived, which one of his little friends. And, but we was going to see if we could just hear them playing behind them fences, the privacy fences. So we did that for a while and we didn't see them. We went back to our house and we hadn't been there very long and Dana pulled up and asked if Michael was at our house. And I told her, I said, no, but it's supposed to be at your house. She said, well, I just left my house and they're not and I'm looking for them. I said, well, we've been looking for them. Did she, did, did Miss Moore say if the boys had ever been to her house that afternoon? Or she didn't, I don't think she said that, but you know, I told her, I said, they were, were, they were supposed to be at your house, so we went by there on our way to work, take Pam to work, and then we come back by and see no bikes, and so we walked around, and then here we are, we're fixing to walk, drive around some more, we're heading back to your house. And she said, well, I'm heading to my house, because Don was there. I said, we'll follow you over there. Now, who is Don? Don is their daughter. Their daughter. How old was she at the time? Best guess. Six. Six years old? No, old. no she was older than Stephen. But she was 10, maybe 11. Okay. Just guessing. What about Mr. Moore? Did you ever talk to him that, that afternoon or evening? No. no he was truck driving somewhere, working. Okay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> after you talk to uh, Ms. Moore, she comes by your house and tells you that she's, she's looking for him, mm -hmm. looking for the, for the boys too. At this time, do you know anything about Christopher Byers? No. Okay. Um, so what what do you do after you talk to Miss Moore? She said she's going to her house. I said, well, I'm coming over there too. And cause we went over there and Don was still there. And Don said she's seen them go this way on their bicycles. So, you know, while we're standing there in the front yard talking, here comes a big bully looking dude walking across the street. And I look at him and I said, who's that? And of course, it's Mark Byers. That's when I first met Mark Byers. Okay. And he was, looked like the shaggy DA. No quote to that. <laughs> <laughs> but he comes across the street and he said, have y'all seen Chris? And we said, no, but have you seen Mike and Stevie? No. Uh, I think right then is when we put together that they might have been together at that time. Well, when, uh, when Don Moore says that she saw him going up the street. Did she say who all she saw? No. But she said they were on her bikes. Because Dana said she asked her when she got there, you know, has Michael be home? Has he called? Something like that. And is Stevie with him? Something like that. And uh, Mark come cr walking across the street saying, did y'all see Christopher? And I think right then is when we figured out they might have all three been together. And you never met? Mark Byers before that day. Okay. What what happens? And you you still have Amanda with you? Correct. Okay. What happens then? 
I, I believe I tried to around a little bit more looking for and then <coughs> go back to David and Bobby's house and I dropped Amanda off there and I asked David, I said, would you go help me, you know, try to find these boys. He said, come on, let's go. Because he knew Stevie you, up in Blyville. He knew Pam's first husband and he knew Pam all, most of her life or all of her life. And so working with him, seemed like a pretty good guy. He looks like he's easy top. He's got long hair and long beard. And so uh, he went with me and we drove around. He was with me probably two or three o'clock in the morning, May the 6th. When did you see Pam again? When I picked her up from work. Okay, you remember about what time that was? It was right at 9 o'clock. Okay, and when you went to pick her up, who all was with you? Amanda. Just Amanda? Okay. Okay, I had picked her up. Yeah, because I had her with me. I uh, uh, picked Pam up. When you met Pam uh, at, at her job, what was the first thing y'all talked about? Pam liked her every other night come out of the, uh, the building with two pieces of candy. One for me and one for Steve. She came out that night with two pieces of candy and she asked for Stevie. And I said, Pam, we haven't been finding him yet. And she says, he's dead. And I said, Pam, don't say that. Because who would think that? I was getting nervous a little bit before I picked Pam up because it started getting dark. And when your kids is out there after dark, when, as a parent, you know, you get them things. The first thing Pam said was, he's dead. And I said, don't say that. He is. I said, how do I you say that? You know, I don't know why she said that, but she said that. Do you know who, uh, who was the first family or the first ones to call the police on this? I know when we was at the Dana's house when I first met Mark, we said right then we was going to call the police. But I thought I called them before that. And I can't remember, but it seemed like I did. But I ain't going to sit here and say that. I'm, I'm just trying to think back. Did you have a home phone at that time? Would you have called from your home or? No, a pay phone. Pay phone? Yeah. Did you have a working home phone at that time? Sure. Did you? Okay. Um, I might have even called from there because I don't, I don't remember that. But I, I remember uh, when I was at the Moore's house and I met Mark. I remember telling Dana because they both said this one called police. And I told one of us that you know tell them Stevie ain't here too. So I think I didn't call. I didn't make that call right then. But I you know, mentioned that to Dana. Okay. So. After you have gotten and, and picked up Pam at work, where do y'all go? What happens then, I guess? I think we go by the house first, or we, we might have went to Robin Hood first, over in the wooded area where someone's, you know, the last people that we talked to said they'd seen them go in Robin Hood area. We didn't know there was a Robin Hood area there. Who did you talk to that said that they'd seen them go, the boys going there? Some of the neighbors, because there was a lot of people out there. You know, we was going door to door, asking if you seen three little boys, and someone said that they'd seen them going to Robin Hood. Around the time some show come on. So, you know, from that, it seemed like from that time on, we just couldn't let go of Robin Hood. What did, you, what did you know about Robin Hood Hills that day? I didn't know a thing about it. You ever heard of it before that day? Not a thing. Um, and when we got out there, I just thought, I can't see our boys coming out here because of what it looked like. What did you describe for me what you remember it looking like? Like a jungle. It looked like something that grown-ups would go in, not kids, and just trails through the wooded area, you know, and ditches of water back there that 
I couldn't see eight year old boys hanging around. So you, I take it, you went in into this wooded area. Mm -hmm. Who all? Do you remember who all went into that wooded area during the time you were there? I know when the police were called, Regina come out, and she went in with us a little ways, and turned around and come back out because it was it was hot, and it was muggy, and it was grown up, and it was full of mosquitoes, and you know everybody was getting mosquito bit, and so, and I believe it was starting. To becoming the shift change and Regina told us that she's going to pass it on down there to the police that all oh, this was going on back here but there was a lot of people. Regina, is that, that a police officer? Regina Meeks. Okay, okay. There was a lot of people out there going yeah. through the woods. Do you remember, if you could tell me as many people as you can remember by name? David. Jacoby? Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't know anybody else. Did Pam go into the woods? Not until I picked her up. And we did, went in together. Did you go into the woods before you picked up Pam? Sure. You did. Remember about what time that was? Six, six thirty. Okay, who was with you at that time? David. David Jacoby. Anybody else? Just a lot of neighborhood people. Because there was people on three wheelers, four wheelers, motorcycles, bicycles on foot. That was you know, help calling herself, helping us look for three kids. Is there anything that you saw that, uh, was it was it daylight or dark that when y'all went out there the first time? Daylight. Daylight. Is there anything out there that, that struck you as unusual or odd that you saw? Nothing other than I wouldn't have been out here. This is not a place I hang out. You know. And we were told at one time that there was something that covered up a hole or something and they thought they might be in that hole so some of them little kids that knew where that place was at said they'd go check it. I think uh, there's a buyer's boy, the one that was alive. There's another one alive, I can't think of his name. But I think he was going to go with some of the people that was there and check. I don't know what they're talking about. Was that supposed to be out there in the wooded area also? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Um, so when you, how long do you think you stayed out there in the wooded area the first time? Robin Hood area? I don't know, because we would drive around looking and then go down the service road looking up in there and then walk out in there from both sides. Did you see anybody, uh, hanging around that area that, that I know you said that people were looking. I mean, if you had your best guess, I guess, Terry, um, how many people do you, your best estimate of how many people during this first time you're out there do you think are out in that area looking? 20 to 40. 20 to 40. That's, that's a good number. That's a, that's a large amount of people. Mm -hmm. um, were any of them police officers at that time or were they just citizens? Just Regina and after shift change, another officer come out, but he didn't go in the woods. He stayed in his car. And when you get done, and is this the first time you're out in the wooded area? Or the, okay. When you get, when you leave there, when you, how long after you leave there do you go pick up Pam? I picked Pam up at nine o'clock. Uh, you know, not only are we looking in the wooded area, but people keep saying, well, there's three boys riding a bicycle over here. We've seen three boys over here. Someone said three boys, so we would go everywhere with that we heard. I know I did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what. You know, there was a time I was in the woods. I seen Mark and his wife, Melissa, drive down the service road looking, you know, looking up in the woods. When, uh, after you got Terry, did uh, did you go straight back to, to the Robin Hood area after you picked her up from work? Pam. Uh, I'm sorry, Pam, excuse me. Uh, I believe we did. And did she, she go in the woods that time with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, where was Amanda? Probably to Jacoby's. Oh, no, you see, yeah, she, it seemed like we might have took her back there. Okay. Because Pam wanted to go in the woods. At that time, when you after you picked Pam up, you 
you go back to the Robin Hood area, how many people are going are in the woods at that time? I know Pam called her dad, and her dad and her mom come down from Blywell, mm -hmm. and they're with her some of that night. I can't tell you exactly what times, but they they're, they're with her some of that night. Uh, most of the night, matter of fact, and uh, I don't know how many people at the time was with us because you know I, I, David was still with me, and then Pam got with me, but Pam was also with her dad and mom that night. Okay. Let's move through the night all the way. Did you ever go back home during the night to Magali? We, we did so we could change clothes. Okay. Yeah. Pam had her work uniform on and uh, she wanted to go back and change, so we did. And we, I might have put on all sleeve or something to keep mosquitoes off of us, but, or got mud spray on there before we done it. But I did take her by the house so she could change. Yeah. Did y'all go back to the Robin Hood area after you, after you changed or all she changed? All night long. All night long. Okay. Um, let's let's move forward to daylight on, on May 6th, the next morning. Okay. Carry me through from, from daylight on through that day. Tell me what's, what's going on, what you're doing, what you and Pam are doing. From daylight, uh, Pam had made the statement to the police or somebody that her ex-husband, she thought, done it. Because we couldn't find Stevie. We didn't know where they said She thought he might kidnap Stevie. So they called him, and he comes down the next morning. Uh, there's a guy, a bum, walking down, to crossing that bridge by Catfish Island on that street, is that Missouri Street? Um, or yeah, at street. the time it was 7th Street, I believe, where Catfish Island was located. Okay, there's a, a bum walking on that street, and he's wet, and looking terrible, but he walks, follows, gets on the railroad tracks, and starts going west. You see this this person? I see this guy. This a white male, black male? Like, like, just give me a good physical description of best you can. About how old he, he is and, and what he looks like. I'm not good at guessing the black folks' age, but he seemed like he had long locked hair, uh, just old raggedy looking clothes, maybe 40s age. Get roughly guessing the thirties to forties okay. when he's age. Okay. Um, but we, you know, we notice him. I notice him especially because I, you know, we're focused on Robin Hood. He's coming from that area, and but he's noticeable, and you, you that image sticks in your brain. But we spend the rest of the morning after daylight. Uh, we go to the school to see if they show up at school. Uh, we we're still riding around, still walking around through Robin Hood. Who is we when you're talking about we? Family. Uh, during the night, you know, we're out in and out Robin Hood all during the night. Pam, uh, her dad, myself, David. Up until David, I asked David, I said, man, you, you got to go home because you got to go work in the morning. And uh, just friends, I and mean, really not friends, just family. Yeah, it's really me and David and her dad for a while. Okay. Now, um, you said you've seen this, you saw this, this black male. Um, who was with you when you saw him? Pam was there. He might. She's seen Steve, Pam's ex-husband, might have been in the area. I'm not sure if he made it there yet, but uh, I don't know, not be honest about it. Okay. He was somebody that just looked like a bum out here going on. Take, take us on through. 
Just keep going with what you remember from that moment. Well, after we go to the schools, we go back to Robin Hood, and there's the media there. I think Ben Watson was a reporter at the time that was there. And because uh, we had called, Mark had called Search and Rescue in Marion, and they said they couldn't come until West Memphis Police Department he called them and said, show up, you know, come out here, we got problems. So, you know, we felt like we'd done what we knew to do. And, but the daylight comes rolling around. Mark and Melissa went home during the night and they showed back up daylight. And so we go to school, they don't show up, we go back out to Robin Hood and there's the medium. And they're live, broadcasting live. And then wasn't too long after that, here comes search and rescue, here comes police officers from everywhere. And the morning goes on, you know, they start to search and doing things. I'm watching, talking to some of them as they're going down the bio in a little boat. And they tell me they're going to drain the bio or something like that. Mm -hmm. but I don't know. We spend the rest of the day still riding around, me and Pam. And her dad had to take his wife back to Blondel to be with the kids up there. And while they were up there, the next day, while they're up there, uh, me and Pam's riding around. We go get something to eat, we really couldn't eat. Uh, we go somewhere and we hear somebody say they found three boys and they tell us it's on that road by the apartments over there. Mm -hmm. And so we fly back over there, me and Pam, and Jolene might have been with her at the time. Seemed like she was, but I'm not sure. Jolene? Her sister. Pam's sister? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but seemed like she might have been, I'm not, don't quote me on that, but we get back over there and we see the crime scene tape up there and we don't know what's going on, but there's a lot of people there. We park our vehicle, we get out, we start running up to the tape and Pam faints. And help her get back to the car. And I go up to the I go up to the crime scene table. Gary Gidge will stand there. I pass Pam's husband, ex husband. He said they won't let you pass the table. And I said something to him, kept on walking. I get up there and Gary Kitch will stand there and ask him, I says, have you found something? I didn't know Gary. And I asked him, have y'all, what, what'd you find? He said, three boys. He said, I, he said, I think it's a homicide, or it looks like a homicide, something like that. I asked him, I said, what? He said, it looked like they'd been murdered. And I just fall on my knees and start crying. I look back here, Pam, and she's, they're trying to get her woke up. And she's having a hard time. Side real quick on this.
So you've talked to Gary Gitchell. He's told you what what's been found, what they found, uh, and that they were treating it as a homicide. Is that right? I guess. He just told me it looked like a homicide, it looked like they'd been murdered. Did you hear anything? Were there a lot of people around there at that time? There was. Did you hear anybody saying anything about it? Any, any, any rumors circulating at that time that you remember hearing? No. How long did you stay there? Did, did you stay there a while or just try to get Pam out of there or what did you do? Try to get Pam back to the house. Yeah, because she fainted and we got her back to the car and, and then back to the house later. I don't know how long we was there. <clears throat> now, as far as, as, as Stevie, was there, did he have any, I guess, it, for lack of a better term, any prized possessions that, that he kept with him? Anything that he wore or, or kept in his pockets or anything that, that you would know of, that you remember from back then? Anything that, it, you know, in the mind of an eight-year-old, anything that we consider, that, that, that they might consider special? Maybe, a, his, I think he might have had a Ninja Turtle watch. I'm just guessing, but it seemed like I remember that. I don't know anything else. Not, not, not at this time. And it's, it's my understanding uh, from us sitting down and talking with Pam a couple of days ago that that uh, you and Pam are now divorced. Correct. Remember, remember what year you divorced? Oh, three, I think. I'm just guessing. Where was the, the divorce? Where did you go to the court on the divorce? I never had to go to court. I, he used an attorney in Osceola. I can't think of his name at the moment. He was one of Brent's friends. Brent? Davis. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so was this a was this an uncontested divorce? Was there? Yeah, it was. Okay. Um, who filed? I did. You did. I'm under. What were your grounds? All the abuse, the accusations, the threats coming from the family, side of the family. Well, what do you, you kind of, if you could, could you could explain that to us, what you're talking about? Mm hmm After this happened, for some reason, the family, some of her family, went around and started telling people, Terry Hobbs killed their kids. I don't know why they done this. Uh, so she convinced her brother, Jackie Jr. Hicks, that I'd kill them kids and he would make the threatening remarks to me, I'm gonna kill you. If it hadn't been for dad, I would have killed you already, his daddy. I couldn't for the life of me understand why they would think on this line, but and the, the abuse of them going around telling people I did it. The threats that coming from the family, the boy, the brother, uh, that he's gonna kill me for doing this. Which I didn't do this. But still yet, it took a toll on the Hicks family that I've never seen. And of course, I've never been around anything like this. So I didn't know what to expect. But I was seeing things that I just couldn't believe. You know, go around accusing everybody in West Memphis. You know, I mean, we'd go down and talk to, and come down and talk to the police, and Pam would call off people's names she didn't know, but still accuse them of it. So they'd go out and ask questions, I guess. And I'm just saying it take a toll on this family that. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't understand. 
Do you ever have any, any incidents with anybody in Payne family, any kind of physical confrontations, anything after this happened? Sure. Me and Pam bought a home in Raleigh, and Pam being a, at the time struggling with this, we just bought this home up there. We didn't know anybody up there, but you know, I bought it from one of the people at the ice cream company, and one of the boys that the family owned the ice cream company, his girlfriend owned that home, so we bought it from him, financed it, financed it I believe, through FHA. And Pam, Amanda would go right around. You know, we rode bicycles in the neighborhood. And then Amanda had met some girls down the street because she was, didn't know anybody either. So instead of Pam going down there with her, I'd ask Pam, why don't you ride down there? You know, the girls, uh, she wouldn't do it. So I'd ride down there and keep my own Amanda. We just lost one baby. And we're gonna lose another. So I would ride down there with Amanda, keep my eye on her, you know, because we didn't know. Uh, so she met these kids, and I ended up meeting their parents, which was nothing to me, just parents. Well, Pam uh, had this thing in her mind. I loved them women, them kids as parents, the women. And all I was doing was keeping an eye on my daughter. And so this one particular day, or really several days, Pam would accuse me of them of wanting me, as it's a woman thing, or me of wanting them, which was nothing to it. Uh, and this one certain day, it just she kept on and on and kept on and wanted to argue with me about them kids as mother. And I kept trying to tell her, Pam, quit. You know, she just making this stuff up. And she tried the same thing here in West Memphis. Whenever I caught her with that Mexican, she just automatically blowed off the wall. You got a girlfriend over here? Well, I didn't have a girlfriend over here. I didn't play that. Uh, but uh, when we got over there and this started happening, this one day I looked at Pam over and over and kept trying to tell her this is nothing to this. And shut it up, leave me alone. I'd go in another room. Here she come in another room and just nag it on. Finally I looked at her and said, I'm gonna slap the dog out of you if you don't shut this up. Well I wasn't happy about saying it, but I told her that. And she kept on so I'd go in another room. Here she'd chase me in another room, say the same stuff. So we're sitting on the couch and I said, Pam, quit. I tried my best to get her to quit. And she wouldn't do it. So I just reached over and backhanded her. And I know I was wrong for that, but I didn't care. You know, but she, I tried to get her to quit. This went on for hours, not minutes. This went on for hours. And I did reach across her and she backhanded her right in the mouth. And when I did, she popped me upside the head and grabbed my car keys and threw them across the house and grabbed her car keys going head out the door. And so I just thought, no, no. And I grabbed her arm, which had her keys in, I was going to throw hers over there too, kind of childish, but just what was going through my mind. So I grabbed her, we wrestled over her keys and uh, got her with my elbow when we was wrestling. She, uh, that was the end of the fight on my elbow here. And she told everybody after that that I broke her jaw. She called her family and told them I broke her jaw. And I knew what that was going to do. And it was going to bring them down here. So I called the police in Memphis. This is, there's two recordings of me calling the police in Memphis. One before. After, after the fight, I called him and told him about the fight and what happened and what she done. And they tell me that we can't send someone out there to wait on. But when they get there, uh, 
calls back and Will sits the line up there and I said, Thank you. But so we took him about an hour, maybe a little longer, to her brother, his wife, her dad and her mom come knocking on our door shortly, about an hour, hour and a half after that. And they come in yelling at me because she's, you know, I slapped her. I ain't gonna deny that. And I hit her my elbow. I ain't gonna deny that. But I ain't beat her up like she told her everybody. And I didn't break her jaw like she told her everybody. I knew that. And after the fight, me and Amanda, you know, I felt bad about it. And there's my wife sitting there looking like this over nothing. Uh, so we made her ice packs, me and my daughter. And give them to her, put on her and jaws. And she, her family showed up. And her dad come in yelling at me. Brother come in looking at me. And so I seen a chance where I could get my telephone. And I grabbed my telephone, walked outside, called the police again. And tell them, you know, I got some trouble out here. They're back. They're here. Uh, Get me and them people send the police out here. And they say, okay. I said, well, in the meantime, I have a gun. I'm going to load it. I'm going to load it on me. I had 357 Magnum. I loaded it with hollow points. Mm -hmm. uh, put it under my shirt. And walked outside. Had my phone. Stood by my truck outside and, and waited for the police to get there. Uh, The dad and the, his son come out and looked at me while I was standing out there by my truck, waiting on the police to get there, and walked back in the house. And directly the boy come out there, Jackie Jr., come walking out there. I was standing by the, at the bed of my truck, waiting on the police to get there, not saying nothing to anybody. And he walks up to the side of my truck. He said, Terry, man, what happened? And then he reached over and grabs me by the back of my hair and starts pulling me backwards. And I've got my arm on the side of my bed of my pickup. And I'm just hanging on, you know, like that, the best I can. But he's a big old boy. And I hang on until uh, I lose my grip. And then I don't know what happened. After that, uh, until I'm laying on the ground, I wake up. I'm thinking if I wasn't knocked out, I don't remember none, nothing else until I'm laying flat on the ground. He's got both his knees on my back, and he has my head twisted like this. And I'm thinking, this has got to quit. And I pull my gun out, point it up in the air, and pull it through. But it just so happened to hit him. Uh, I didn't point at him and shoot him. I was just going, let him know I had a gun. You know, I could have yelled it out, sure. I just pointed up in there and pulled the trigger. And knocked him off of me. And then the uh, ambulance showed up before the police did over there. But they came and picked him up. And they, they put me through the ringer over there with that. Okay. <clears throat> um, when was the last time that you and Pam actually lived together? Probably 05, 06. Because she moved. she come back down here. Maybe 04. I'm not sure. 05, 06, something like that. She come back down here and went to work at Superlow on Code the Pipe. And she lived with me for a while. And then she moved out and got her apartment on Code the Pipe. And lived there until she moved back to Bottom. Was there any other occasion? She, I guess, when she, before she moved out, 
Did, was there any other running with the police? Oh yeah, there were several of them. Any of them where you were arrested during that time? Yeah, thanks to Jolene, Pam's sister. Was that the, the, the last time the two of you lived together? You and Pam? No, this was uh, after my divorce. And I believe it was after my divorce our divorce and me and Pam had another separation. She took off the Bible and I called her up and I said, if you go up there with John and Jolene, don't you ever come back to my house again. So the next day she brings Jolene to my house. Jolene brings in a bag of weed and a bag of white powder and of course she had, I don't know this, she had a hit on her. but. They bring the police, the Memphis police with them. Okay, uh, they come, they get inside. I had broke the key off in the keyhole because I didn't want them in our house because I knew what these people are, have done to me in the past and I didn't want them to come back and do it again. So I broke the key off and then my daughter breaks into the back door, Amanda. And I open, I seen that she ain't gonna quit, open the door and let her in. And she goes over and opens the other door. And the police is out there. And then Pam and Julian's out there. Well, they come in the house. And my daughter, I had a half a joint. I ain't gonna lie about this. I had a half a joint on a tray under my china cabinet. Uh, my daughter runs straight to that, pulls it out, and gives it to the police. Jolene walks to my bedroom and places that white bag of powder and white and some marijuana on my dresser and goes back in the front and tells the police he's got drugs in his bedroom on his dresser. They run back there and find this and arrest me. And uh, on my way down there, well, matter of fact, as we're walking out of the house, on my, I'm handcuffed, they put me in the police car. Amanda, Pam, and Joe Lynn, they stand on the patio or the carport. Pam and Joe Lynn are yelling top of their lungs, you killed Stevie, they're chanting this, you killed Stevie. They're saying it so loud and so many times that that police officer, when he gets me down there by the car, he says, he, he stops me, he asks me, he says, Who's Stevie? And I tell him a little bit of, about what happened over here. Mm -hmm. and he said, well, I mean, he said, I need to get you away from these women. I said, please do. <laughs> That's just the way that happened. But I did get arrested for that. And they dropped that charge on me over there. Now, I think they were probably going to charge me for that white powder. I told myself, I don't know nothing about that. And neither one of them bags were mine. But that one thing was mine. But I went ahead and they went ahead and charged me for the weed, I think, which came from her. <clears throat> I'm going to go through and show you some pictures and see if you can help me with this. Go through, um, see if they see if you recognize these items, okay? Uh, let me write this, this stuff down. Okay. This. Sheet number one here, I'm going to show you here. Uh, there's a cigarette box and it looks like, uh, looks like maybe some partial dentures. I had one that looked like that. Do you still have it? No. Joanne and Pam took it and gave it to Damien's attorneys. Do you smoke Marlboro's? I, I did at the time. Okay. okay. Um, this is a, uh, a more blown up picture of with the same set. And this was made in Blywell, Arkansas by uh, Dennis Tupper. That look like that looks like, like mine. Yeah. Okay. Would you uh, would you do me a favor? And this is I mean I know you don't have them here. If you have it in front of you, all we have is a photograph. 
Um, when was the last time you remember seeing this? I had it in my file cabinet. Uh, I don't know, probably, I'm just going to guess now. 05, 04, something like that. I don't really remember the date that I last seen that, but I do remember them taking one of my upper partials and doing that with them. If you would, um, I've got this more, like I said, I've got sheet one, sheet two, uh, just so we can show for record that we showed you this. Would you sign, put your name and today's date on each sheet as we go through? And like I said, today's date is June the 21st. Can I round here? I looked at this. Sure. I mean, that, that's fine. I mean, we, we're recording, so it's showing that you're looking at it. But yeah, that's fine. That looks like the ones you had, the upper parcel. It does. Okay. Yeah. If you do the same thing on, on sheet two, and then we'll go through and I'll show you some other items and see if you can help us identify them. Item is number one, two, three, four, and five. They're they're knives. They're mine. Okay. Let's start with number one. Uh, what can you tell me about knife number one? Just a jumpy knife. Remember where you got it? I had that so long. I can't remember where I got it from. Okay. Well, I remember that one when I was running my ice cream route. I found this one laying in the street, and that was. Number or knock number three right here, this one. I really don't remember where that one come from. Okay. What about knock number four? Not really. Because a lot of times I would find them on the ground somewhere and just pick them up and put them in a little box or something like that. What about knock number five? You remember anything about that? Not really. Okay. But they all, they do look like my eyes. Okay. I said that's sheet three, number, yeah, if you'll put down that you viewed those, sheet three, uh, numbers one, two, three, four, five. So far, okay? okay. That may change, but so far, no. But 
Yeah. They're, I mean, they're locked up safe. If they keep right now, is my understanding of what I've been told. So, yeah. let's move to uh, sheet number four here. And there's two items I've got marked one and two on this a photograph. Do you, do you recall these items? Mm -hmm. No, 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 thank you. Because I have a, I do have pocket knives and uh, different knives, but I don't, I don't know because I have some bigger than that, and I never do know whatever happens in them. But uh, I don't think I remember that. Don't remember that knife and Not sheath? Right. Not at the moment. No, because if I did, I'd tell you. Okay. But that don't look like one of mine. No. Okay. You don't remember it though? Okay. I don't remember that now. If you would still sign showing that you viewed it, it's showing you're not remembering it, but that you that you right. you don't remember owning that a knife like that. Well them old knives that I had, I didn't really take them out and look at them, just toss them in the drawer. Treasure. These are stuff you picked up along the way. Now this is sheet number five and it's marked one, two, three, and four as far as the items. Uh, tell me what you remember about those, if anything. This is mine. Okay, you're pointing what numbers? Two and three. Two and three. That's a knife and it looks like a little sheet for it. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, one, seemed like Joe Lynn and her boyfriend bought that for me. But that looks like one that I had from Panama Boat. And that one. Is that the, is the, this right up above that? It's looks like it's got six dollars. Is, is that the cover for that, the box? Be. Tom it could be. Okay. Yeah, I think that come from Panama's sister. Okay. What about? That's just an old joke in that. What about number four? It looks familiar. Same thing, if you sign the date, and this is uh, the next one coming to be the last sheet I'm going to show you. Okay. Here, the last one, this is sheet number six, and it's again marked one, two, three, and four. If you look at the items on that, tell me if you recognize any of those. Yeah. Start with number one. Do you recognize it? Yeah, it's so old wisdom ahead. What about number two? It kind of looks familiar. Now, uh, uh, keep in mind too, it's a, like a knife handle and a sheath, you know, a knife and a sheath, black mm -hmm. uh, sheath um, with a clip on one side. And this is my, and that's the case that this come in. So three is, is yours? Three and four. Three and four, and then four is the black case that he, that Three oh, came in. Okay. Um, most of the knives you had here that, that you recognized, uh, you, just for clarification, did you buy those knives, most of those, or did you? Some of them were gifts, but most, and some of them I found, and some of them I bought just because I liked the way they looked. Like this is one of them ones I like the way it looked. Number three on this one? It is. Okay. But I never carried them. That was, that was my next question I was going to ask you. Right, did, no. you ever, did you ever carry a pocket knife on you for any reason, like for work or for anything? No, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, I don't, I don't have any more to show you. That was the last of those. Um, let me ask you this, Terry. Do you remember... Uh, you remember Stevie ever having a knife at all? I don't know if 
think I won at the Boy Scouts or not. But well, he did go to Boy Scouts. I don't know if they gave him a pocket or not. But his granddaddy may have given him one. Because his granddaddy was really proud of him. He liked it before. It's possible. I can't say yes or no to that. No, honestly. So if he, if he had one, you wouldn't have known what it would look like? or. Well, if I seen it, I might recognize it, but I can't place one at the moment. Now, did you ever keep any of, uh, of Stevie's personal possessions after after their death, after the boys were, were killed? Well, I ain't gonna say I kept them. We, we kept them in our home up until Pam would take off and she'd try to take some. And I still had some pictures of him, sure. Do you have any other personal items that you, you know, we're talking about? And you're a little boy here, right. as far as you know, right. toys or any, any any personal effects he is. Not time to think of. Did Stevie ever mention to you, um, or did you ever hear through Pam of Stevie mention and have any any problems with any older kids or uh, name any other boys that you had, you know any, any other kids that you hadn't heard of before? Um, you know, any, prior. To May the fifth. I haven't had heard any. George, Chris, and Mike. It's about the only three names I remember. Now, like or Aaron. Seemed like he. Oh, I seem like he was that Aaron Hudson boy. Seemed like that was one of his friends. Were they the same age? I don't remember. I don't know how old Aaron was. Okay. It seemed like I remember hearing his name more. When when you and Pam moved to uh, moved to West Memphis, did you move to the house on, on South Macaulay? Is that the first house you were at, or did you live somewhere else? No. If I remember right, we moved south of uh, on South Avalon down in that area. There was a house down there. I don't remember the street, but that we rented. Then we moved over there behind Kentucky Chicken on the roads, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I remember right, there was a house there. Then we moved past Macaulay, another house over that way before Macaulay. Four houses. Were those all rental houses or? They were. Okay. And the, the house on Macaulay, the South Macaulay, the, the last home you lived in here, uh, was that on? Oh, was that a rental house? Don Campbell. Don Campbell. It was his rental house. Mm -hmm. Did you ever move anywhere else in West Memphis after after that? After living on that 16, 1601 Macaulay or what? Six. Yeah. We mean, uh, did did y'all live anywhere else in, in another location in West Memphis other than after South Macaulay or after Macaulay? No, we moved. Moved. Moved to Blount. Okay. How long? Uh, I guess how long after? Stevie's death, did y'all move to Blindwood? A month or less. Terry, uh, um, have you got any questions? No, oh, so far. Have you got, is there anything else that you can think of that we hadn't gone over there, we hadn't asked you, or something you've remembered through the years um, that you think might be helpful to us you know, as any kind of follow-up in this investigation? Well, really, I don't know what you're investigating, uh, so I don't know how to answer that. Well, all I'm asking is if there's anything that you feel might be uh, might be pertinent or, or have some value uh, to this case at all that uh, we might forward to the prosecuting attorney if, if necessary. Um, I know I've seen a picture, and I don't know if this means anything, I've seen a picture that uh, Davy Nichols sitting on my couch at my house with Chris and Mike, you know, Stevie and Mike on each side of my thing. Have you seen that? I know, sir, I have not. Where did you see that picture? Well, I think Gary Gitchell had it. I don't know how he got it. And they said it was my couch. And I don't know, I don't remember that. No, of course, I know we didn't know Damien Nichols or nothing, boys. But I don't know how, if that was our couch, that that picture got taken. But I've heard about this picture somewhere out here. 
Did you know any of the no. any of the three uh, that were no. charged and ultimately convicted of this crime? Have you kept in touch with any of the other parents? Um, Mark. Mark? Mm -hmm. You still stay in touch with him? Mm -hmm. um, I know his wife is deceased now, that's correct. Um, what he's about remarried. The, he's remarried. Mm -hmm. What about the uh, the Moors? We brought across Dana and Todd up here at Walmart in West Memphis a few times after that. And Tom's just hateful. I mean, I guess he's still mad about all that. But at the same time, Pam was accusing Todd of killing these kids, and Todd kind of took that wrong. You know, because he was out of town working that night. But yeah, we had some a confrontation about that one time. You and who? I thought Todd was going to beat Pam up. <laughs> yeah. I, he was mad because Pam was accusing him. I mean, Pam didn't know him. You said that, uh, just going to touch back again on this picture you were talking about, you actually saw this photograph? Or did you just hear about it? You said the one with Damien and, and yeah, the two boys. Yeah, I've heard about it, but I don't remember if I seen it. It seemed like I seen it you somewhere. Know, you heard it from who? Uh, Mark. Mark Myers? Mark Myers. Yeah. He said that someone's got this picture and it's of my couch. He said Gary Mitchell told him it was Terry's couch. But it seemed like Gary talked to me about that one time. If we needed to get a hold of Mark Myers, how could we do it? What's the best way to reach him? Sell Myers home phone. Okay. Um, you have his number? Well, I'm trying to confirm make sure that if you're still in touch with him, you have, may have more updated information than we did. Right He's now. not my local person that's called. Uh, Where's he living at now? I have a phone number. If you got one, I'll, I'll take it. I will. your time uh, and your courage for coming in and going back through this with us. Uh, it's, it's a tough thing to do, to, uh, you know, at best. But, uh, well, I don't know what Jolene is up to, but she has, ever since her brother died, and that was a sad thing the way all this has happened. She's constantly reminded Pam that when Pam was still with me, that you're still with the SOB that killed our brother. And I didn't kill her brother. But she, they just hope the rest of the family looked at it like I did. And we settled that. I thought we settled that in Memphis. I do have uh, one or two quick things. Um, they were mentioning when we talked to them earlier in the week about some kind of a uh, some kind of a contract with Dimension Films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What uh, what is that actually about? They're making a Hollywood movie. Uh, they come down here and bought our rights, mine and Pam's rights, and to make that movie. And from what we've been hearing, it might not be a good movie. What, uh, you said they we bought your rights? We might have made a big mistake. What did they, what did they, what kind of agreement did you come on as far as the, the rights? Life rights. Well, I mean, as far as they they offered you so much money, I, I take it. What did the, what what did y'all settle on? Twelve and five. Uh, each or me and Pam. You each got twelve thousand five hundred. Um. 
you know, it's one other thing. She didn't bring you the contract? Uh, no, sir, I've not seen the contract. It was mentioned when we were talking earlier this week, but I've not seen one, no, sir. Um, you talk about a book that you was writing. That's why. That's what I was just remembering. And you said you started back on the 5th of May and been going on? I've got one. Yeah, they want to look at it. I won't let them. Ron Lax, the investigators want to look at it. I won't let it. But I started this thing back May the 5th and just kept up with everything that's happened. Not everything, I uh, kept up with a lot that's happened. Um, is it something you're handwriting or something you're typing on a computer? Or? Well, I've handwritten it. And I have a writer who's wanting to put it in the book form for me because one day I'm open on the market. Okay. And you, you have that in your possession right now? Mm -hmm. Um, if there's, I don't have any further questions. Any, nothing else that I can think of at this time. Again, Terry, I want to tell you how much we appreciate you coming in. Like he's going to do a digital picture of you to show put with this. That only. It's not intended for anybody else. Okay. Um, and we'll get you out of here. And like I say I appreciate your time. I know this is, has been tough, but I, I, I do have a lot of respect for you actually coming in and talking to us. And I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You will. We're going to do a big picture. I'm going to turn this off. All right. Just about one. We'll do both sides. If you'll do the picture, let's get let's get this gentleman out. Let me see. Oh. Okay. I guess you have to take the lens off. I wouldn't want to put see nothing. Oh, I had...